welcome. Hello. Hello, I hello. Solo. I see Michael. I see Todd. I see Danielle. I'm doing awesome. the, uh, the magic mirror. <laughs> <laughs> I see. So what, welcome, welcome back, Steve. Uh, Steve uh, was missing in action last week. Uh, he was actually doing some very important stuff at the CAA, not the Center for Artistic Activism, but the College Art Assembly. Association. Association, okay. Um, how'd that go? It was good. There were a lot of people there. That uh, I don't want to publicly say what I... I guess I've publicly said that I think that conference is a waste of time before. <laughs> So why not right. do it again? But um, there, there, it was good. There was a lot more things that I thought were relevant this time, and there were a lot more, uh, and, and there were a lot of people in our session. So yeah, uh, that was well. Good. But you did. Speaking your of what? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. We uh, with Pat special guest star Patricia Gerino, Um We talked about popular culture, mass culture, um, and how we can use that for our organizing and activism. And there's a recording, so if you weren't able to log on or you were doing something else that time, you can go to the link, which should show up in your chat, yeah. um, and go check it out. It was good. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, and it's but, you know, speaking of podcasts. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, but speaking of wasting of time, I have spent more time in meetings in the, since Donald Trump got elected. Um, I mean, I, it seems like basically half my life is taken up with political meetings. Um, some which are great, um, but some which aren't so great, right? And my hunch is most of you out there in webinar land have had similar experiences. Um, so what we're going to be talking about today is how to have fabulous meetings, how to have meetings which are inventive, which are creative, which actually leave you more energized than drained at the end of it. Yeah, and before we talked about that, I wanted to um, oh, yes. talk about why you'd want to work with other people in case you're starting to rethink it. And also, uh, I think a lot of artists, sometimes it's easier to think, well, I can just do this myself. You know, like I, I, I'm, I'm used to working alone anyway. Um, and, but there are some advantages. One is that you get perspectives from other people that you wouldn't get. Um, insights. There's a lot of, uh, you're smarter in, in groups than you are alone. Um, going along with that is a different expertise. So mm -hmm. um, people know, have skills that you don't have. And when you can combine those skills and be more effective, and then hopefully in the end, it's less work. That's the point, right? Is, is you don't want to work with other people to make it more work. It should be less work. So um, those are some of the advantages, but bad meetings make those things pretty hard. Yeah. <laughs> Try to think of what makes a bad meeting. Yeah. Lots of things make a bad meeting. Yeah, um, I've been in them. I was in one yesterday, not saying where, but I was in one, and uh, and I just felt like I didn't really need to be there. That yeah. made it bad. That there was nothing I could add that would help it. Yeah, yeah, and and also I've been in meetings where I'm not quite sure why any of us are there. Yeah, you know that that idea. Okay, we we're angry. We want to, or angry. We want to do something. We're angry. And so let's get together and have a meeting, and we're there, and I'm just, but I'm not quite clear why we're there, other yeah. than to just talk about how angry we are. Well, when I was thinking before about what makes a bad meeting, everything fell under two categories. One is the things we've talked about, which is like, there's no purpose, real, right. really. Like, I don't know why I'm here, or this could have been handled over email. You're basically just reading me an email that you could have sent. Um, but the other one is um, uh, selfishness which is mm -hmm. a meeting where it's just about people expressing themselves or talking about how angry they are or figuring out something that only really needs to be figured out among three people and wasting everyone else's time in the process. Um, yeah. So those are the things we want to avoid is like this purposelessness and the selfishness, right? It should be for everyone in the group and it should have a real direction and meaning and stuff. So do you realize that's a that's a classroom that you're just showing there? Really, I thought it was like a meeting of designers. I think it might be me, but it's also it's like it's it, it's it's about what we do, Steve. I think it was subconscious you put that up there. Well, I think teaching helps you figure out how to do this, right? Because if you don't engage yeah. students, you're in trouble. Yeah, they walk out. 
Yeah. So, um, so how do we have good meetings? So Steve and I talked about this over the last week and we came up with ultimately what are about 10 pointers. Um, and we'll get, we're just going to go through them and then we're going to give you an example of something that we do in our workshops our, our big five day workshops, uh, that you can use in those meetings to get better results. So should we start? Yeah, let's do it. What do we got for number one? Okay. So the first thing is, um, start small and all of the big projects that Steve and I actually know each other from, from doing this, like small meetings in bars, trying to get something off the ground. And there were probably like four or five people there. And the real ideas happened when, you know, before those last two showed up. So the yeah. idea here, one is like hand pick the people that you want to work with. Yeah, that's super important because I think sometimes the temptation, particularly amongst those uh, progressives is, we want to have a mass meeting. We want to deal with everybody. The community. Um, the community, exactly. The people, the masses. The problem is, is that that's not real communication. That That's only one person standing up in a room and talking to a whole bunch of other people. To have real communication, you need a scalable group of people. And you always want to start with people that you actually want to have a conversation with, or you want to bring them in because they have a perspective you might not have. So related to that, when I bring in collaborators, I always try to let them know why I'm asking them, that why it's important that they are there um, instead of anybody else. And so I'll tell them like, you know, I know you really well and I know that you do this and that's the insight that we need at this meeting. And it helps them feel comfortable speaking up also. Yeah, they know why they're there. Yeah. Um, from there, you make a core trusted group and you can build it. Um, but as people get added, they they become part of a, a cohesive group, which is yeah. good. You know, back when I was a communist, we used to call it a cadre, but we don't use those words anymore. Cadre is good. I like that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, and the idea of a cadre was is you need a, a, a core group of people. We also call it an affinity group now. Um, yeah. You know, people that you can trust that have your back. Yeah. Yeah, that you know, you know their names, you know what they're good at, you know what they mean when they say things, you know. Um, and then from there, if you meet consistently, you can grow, right? So the the really most important thing is that you meet consistently and it stays sort of productive. It's not how big it is. It's not even that you're getting a lot done, although that's important. But if that group meets consistently and supports each other, and can grow from there, that's that's most of it. Yeah, something will happen. And I think one of the things about this create a core trusted group and meeting consistently is that one of the things that makes meetings and political action productive and fun is um, friendships. Um, yeah. A lot of great friendships have started in these meetings and that happens and takes place over time. So this becomes your, uh, a friendship group as well. So that's great lead to our next thing which is um, making people feel welcome and the idea basically is every whenever anyone comes you welcome them you say thank you for coming because it takes time and effort to get there it takes for sometimes for some people money and expense and babysitters or childcare and to show up and so to make sure that they understand that they're appreciated for arriving right and it's also something to do as people leave, and we'll talk more about this later, which is you thank people for coming. Um, but you know, meetings are social situations. They're also incredibly scary. Um, we know how to act when we walk into a Starbucks, for example, right, or a TGIF Fridays. Um, a lot of people, particularly new people new to politics, don't know how to enter a political space. And you need to give them cues, you need to give them welcome so that they actually feel comfortable in what can be an alienating place. And yeah. going along with this is about using language which isn't alienating. No acronyms, no shortcuts. All of those things exclude people. Yeah, I, I, it's, uh, it goes a long way. Steve and I went to a mega church, speaking of yeah. the podcast that we mentioned earlier. Yeah. We, for research, we went to a mega church. At the mega church, so many strangers came up to us and introduced themselves and wanted to make sure that we knew that we were welcome. And all. they were like nailing it when it came to welcoming people. Yeah. They met us in the line outside and talked to us. Yeah. And I, they, they creeped me out because they just wanted to talk about our Lord and Savior. Um, 
but still, no, they, they knew what they were doing. Remember they were like, they, they, most of them were like really You're nice. Right. Just wanted to know how things were going. Yeah. And this was, was our first time. You're right. You're right. That was the underlying. Uh, <laughs> it's what <laughs> you I were reading the subtext. <laughs> exactly are you a believer <laughs> okay so anyway so welcome everyone um, yeah. so, so next thing is uh that fun is a good thing to have in your meetings yeah. and i uh, two weeks ago this was posted on boing boing it's an old iww poster yeah. and I, there's so many great things in this so this is the international workers of the world like the beginnings of unions and they don't have a meeting they have a picnic and yeah. a reunion, like they're, it's a joke, right? Um, so they're having a picnic. These are the program of events, right? Yes, there are speakers down below in different languages, but there's a hundred yard dash. There's a fat men's race. There's an all fours race, a sack race. So there, there's a skinny men race. There's a fat women know. race. <laughs> no skinny women race. I'm not sure why. It's bizarre, right? I mean. But they, it's like silly games, you know? Yeah. Um, and then they have a tug of war between the Swedes and the Finns. <laughs> exactly. I want to I want to see that. <laughs> well, and also, do you notice that they have speakers in six different languages? And it's about welcoming you in no matter what language group you're from. Yeah, yeah. And at the dancing pavilion. Good. Yeah. So there's all this fun stuff that's happening. Now, you don't have to have like an egg and spoon race, but um, fun is good. Having food there is right. important. Um, making it social, right? Yeah. And the venue is important, right? Yeah. Uh, it's at the dancing pavilion. We often say, well, let's have a meeting and we're going to have it in this really closed space where it's really claustrophobic. It doesn't need to be there. Most bars are happy to have people come in at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, many churches will allow you to use them in off hours or VFW halls. Make it fun. Make it interesting. Um, you notice, if you go back one, Steve? Yes. Uh, to that poster. Um, if you look up in the top left-hand corner, it's uh, Big Bill Haywood, who is one of the uh, leaders. And uh, he's very famous for saying when someone critiqued him, for liking cigars um, and said, wasn't that really a bourgeois custom? He's famous for saying, nothing's too good for the working class. Um, and his point was, is actually what the revolution is about is making those things like fun and pleasure, which are only available to the rich, available to everybody. So start with your meeting. So food, having having good spread is good. Um, drinks also can be good. We talked about meeting in bars. I can't tell you how many different creative actions were planned in the yeah. back room of a place called Dylan's on 19th and Folsom in San Francisco, or like at that radio bar that we met at, you know, there was a yeah. bar across the street. You don't necessarily have to be drunk, but yeah. And yet, although sometimes it helps, um, but do a check in with the people because some people do have a history with alcohol. And so you just move it to a cafe, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, and it, the drinks can be things like soda and stuff like that and coffee and caffeine. Yeah. yeah yes. Building on your Big Bill Haywood thing, your revolution should have dancing of some kind. You can take it as a metaphor or literally. Um, as Emma Goldman did on both cases. Uh, the next thing is like, don't you don't have to have meetings in the organization's office. Uh, a lot of times if you work in an office or an organization, it's a hard place to like shift to having wild ideas if you're still in the same environment. So getting out to another place. And then Steve, you, you were talking about the Ministry of Love. Can you tell us? Yeah. More? Um, so I was a community organizer in the 1990s in the East Village um, uh, with a group called Lower East Side Collective. And we had a lot of affinity groups, one working on gentrification, another working on gardens, another working on... Um, uh, uh, police violence, um, but one of our standing affinity groups was called the Ministry of Love. And the sole purpose of the Ministry of Love was to throw parties, to greet people, and to make sure people had a good time. Um, and we were a very successful group, and I think partly because everybody knew they were going to have a good time when they came to the meeting, and then after the meeting, the Ministry of Love had to plan something for, all, for us to do. Um, and just in case any of you out there in webinar land think this is sort of a privilege of the privilege, when I was doing that work, I came across um, mention of in El Salvador, during the Civil War in El Salvador, the radical El Salvadorians 
created something which was very close to the Ministry of Love, which anytime they had a liberated area, one of the first groups they would create was a group to create parties and fun. Nice. And that's during the Civil War. Yeah. Yeah, hardcore. Nothing is too good for the revolution. Nothing is too <laughs> nothing, Nothing's too fun for the revolution. Okay, so next, uh, this, this is a theme for the next few, actually, but uh, this is a big one. It's people appreciate leadership. Um, Steve, you, you made this note, democracy flourishes with structure. Yeah, we've all been at a meeting where no one wants to take charge, and usually what ends up happening is the dude stands up and talks for an hour, um, and then everybody who has any responsibilities in life, um, like you know, a job, uh, family, what have you, just slinks out the back door. And it's because there's no structure to allow other people to talk. Um, and so when you don't have a structure, it doesn't mean you have freedom. It just means that you've given it over to an invisible structure, which often ends up patterning things on sort of male supremacy, white supremacy, education, and so on and so forth. So structure actually is good because it creates spaces for people that otherwise get locked out. I think also people um, appreciate that they're, they're going to be guided through and they're not going to have to do all the organizing themselves. Yeah. As, as long as you're not, you know, that organizing is actual leadership and not oppression. <laughs> You know, like, all right, everyone has to do this now. Um, that that those help things happen, and people are relieved to know that um, someone has thought this through and planned it out. From the from my sort of art experience side, um, you know, creativity works within constraints, uh, and so building some boundaries or some constraints actually allows creative things to happen. The most amazing Hendrix or John Coltrane solo still happen within the structure of a verse and chorus, right? Or like A, B, B, A uh, kind of uh, chord structure. Um, and if I was to tell you to make a piece that could take an infinite amount of time and take up all the space in the universe and uh, you could have an unlimited amount of money and, and uh, unlimited amount of time, it's like, what? <laughs> It becomes impossible to even imagine. Yeah, you just keep, yeah, I mean, you just get completely like paralyzed, paralyzed yeah. by the infinite. Yeah, the one thing I really bugs me when uh, arts organizations contact me to like maybe do a piece or or show or do a project. They're like, you can do whatever you want, and I'm like, no, no, <laughs> no I need give me point me in a direction, you know. So so anyway, offering some of that leadership is helpful. So. We're going to go into some detail with this, and we have an, uh, one of our fun polls. So the so basically our question, let me get the poll ready here, is um, uh, have you ever been in a meeting where they do introductions? And the introductions start with, like, tell us your name, what you do, and why you came. And the first person is great. They're short. You know, they say, my name's Steve. I do blah, 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 you know. And then as it goes around, it gets longer and longer and longer till the last person is like, it's seven minutes long. It's most of their life story. It's what they're angry about. Why the first thing that happened to them as a child that led them to be coming to this meeting. And then 40 minutes later into an hour long meeting, you're just wrapping up introductions. Something like that. Is that a good, did I get it all, Steve? You got, I've been to that meeting. Remember okay. in Russia, that happened. So here's the poll. Have you attended a meeting where the introductions are uh, uh, start short, end with life stories, and take up most of the meeting time? You can vote now. And I want to see the results. We got, okay, half the people have voted. <laughs> the answers are coming in. All right. I'm going to give you a few more seconds here, and then we will view the results we got a much higher voting participation rate than i think any other country <laughs> okay so let's see the results all right so to the five percent of you that is awesome right and you yeah. need to come tell us what those meetings are like and help us 
create better meetings. Yeah. So Steve and I, we figured this out the hard way in running our workshops that we needed to do this. So our next recommendation here is uh, to limit introductions. Um, I like to talk about introductions as a movie trailer, right? It's not the movie. It's just enough to get you interested in the movie so that you'll want to see it. And Steve and I often do introductions with a break right after. And we tell people like, you're not going to learn everything about this person, but if you hear something you want to know more about, talk to them at the break, talk to them at lunch. Um, so, so think of, or try to frame the introductions as just like this little piece. The other way you keep it short and Steve, I got to say, you had a stroke of brilliance with this is to, well, we always used a timer. Right. It was really strict, but Steve came up with this thing. You have it with you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So the beauty of an egg timer, and you have to find one that's only like a minute and a half, um, is that a person has to hold it. And if it runs out, they're very conscious of the fact, and everybody in the room is conscious of the fact, that the time has run out. Um, you can also gift extra time that you have to other people. And so it's actually a reward for being selfless as opposed to a reward for being selfish because a lot of the other types of introductions are I'm going to reward the person that actually tells the rest of the room what a great person they are. But this actually reverses that insofar as the good person is the one passing on extra time to other people. Um, so and it's still have- remarkably effective. If you still have 30 seconds of time left, you just hand it to the next person and they can yeah. use that and then they flip it over, right? Yeah. It's a great, it's, it's, once we started introducing it to our trainings, it was wonderful. And it also takes the policing function off of the facilitator. Yeah. It puts it onto an object. Yeah. It becomes part of the whole group. We use stuff with sound too. So, like at the end of the time, the sound would end, then we'd tell people they could finish their sentence. They didn't have to, you know, cut off right there. But the sound part helped. But the, the main thing is we're really strict about this. And I can't tell you how many times we've been thanked for it, too, um, that, that we were strict about introductions. So, um, so there's that one. So let's we've got another poll here. This one is about how meetings end. And um, what we're going to do, let me see. So have you ever attended a meeting that ran over time that was supposed to be 30 minutes or an hour and then ended up being an hour and a half or longer, just went over. So here we go. We're going to launch the poll. Have you attended a meeting that ran over time? You have survived this or no, you've only been to good meetings. So I like got- how you framed this, this, Steve. So it's not just yes or no. <laughs> well, I just wanted to see. I really want to talk to these people that have only gone to good meetings and how it works. So if you are one of those people that is only going to good meetings, tell us how they're handling it because I think this is great or where you work. (laughs) So I'm going to close the poll in a few seconds here. So get your vote in three, two, one, and let's take a look at the results. And we have the same 6%. It's, a couple of people will all know each other and go to great meetings. Yeah. That's what I'm That's great. I, I think it is possible, but I think we've established this is a widespread problem. Yeah. So um, so what do we do about this? Uh, end on time. Yeah. <laughs> Always <laughs> end on time. <laughs> and this is super important because when you don't end on time, not only – are you sort of disrespecting people's time? But some people will have to leave on time, and then they leave feeling guilty. They leave feeling bad, like they are not the, the, the good participants. And that's the last thing you want to do, is have people feel bad leaving a meeting. You want the opposite. You want people to feel good leaving the meeting. I think you also feel like, wait, I agreed to do this, but this isn't what I agreed to. It's, it's like, I don't know if I would... This is a little too strong, but it's kind of a betrayal. Yeah, I know. I think that's exactly what it is. It's like, and we all have super busy lives. It's like, you might have to go pick up your kids. You know, you might have to run to your another, another job. And so you, we are packing these things in and people that are going over are basically saying, you know what? I don't really care about your life. Yeah. It's selfish. Yeah. It goes back to that selfish thing you put up before. And I think people won't come back because they're like, well, you know, last time I planned on doing this and it didn't go that way and I need to be able to plan, right? right. Or this worse. I at 7 and I didn't eat and I expected to be able to eat at 7.15. This isn't going to work for me the next time. Right. 
or worse, the people that do come back are the people that like really, really long meetings. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the other thing we kind of mentioned, uh, it's like consider a ceremony to end it. When Steve and I do our workshops, we actually have a pretty elaborate closing graduation ceremony and conversation that ends every meeting and there's a photograph and stuff. And that works for us, but you know, sometimes people end it with a song or they all put their hands in the middle and go, go team, you know, whatever works for you, but some sort of thing that definitively ends it. So it's not just, Hey, we're, we're out of time. Okay. Thanks for coming. See you next time. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's keep going. Speaking of time. Yeah. Um, all right. So this is also about the sort of selfishness leadership thing, um, leaving space for other voices. One of the great advantages of working with other people is you, again, get their expertise and their experience. So you don't want to just have a meeting where you tell everyone you're like the orator and explaining everything. Um, you want to uh, let in that other expertise and experience. And so figure out how to have space for that. Mm -hmm. Anything you want to add to that before I go into the... Well, to, just, you know, that's part of the structure, is you need to think about the structure in terms of how do you actually facilitate people who may not be as comfortable speaking to speak. Do you make spaces for them? Do you actually go around the room and have everybody share something? And one of the things that facilitators do, and what teachers do as well, is learn how to not call in the people that are always speaking. And say, hey, I want to get to your idea, but before I get to your idea, is there anybody else here who has something to share? But literally, sometimes you have to make awkward spaces yeah. in order for some people, other people to fill those in. Uh, two really quick things, and there's a lot of creative ways to solve this, but um, we use cards sometimes, so everyone can write their ideas up on a card and then they get put on the wall, and, and then everyone looks at them, or we have them all write stuff, so that everyone's ideas are at least up there to be considered, yeah. and it's a little bit faster than everyone's saying them. Um, another yeah. one, it, a good oh. sort of teacher trick that I learned in teaching in public high school was you ask a question and then in your head count to five, which is really long. If It's much longer than you expect. And yeah. so you say, you know, what do people think about this? Or what's the best way that we could go about this? And then just leave, it, it, you, it's amazing how often at the fourth or fifth second, someone will sort of be like, Ah, okay. You know, because they're they sense that void and, and want to fill it. Mm -hmm. The other part of this is uh, you want to allow people to vent, but don't make the meeting about venting. Then it's losing purpose, right? So if someone's upset and they need to say it, they need to say it. But then you, your job is as a leader is to get it back on track. And and if venting is super important, make that the objective for your meeting. We. You know, like after the Trump, you know, election, you know, I think of people, a lot of people just wanted to scream. And so if you have an objective for the meeting, like, we're just going to come and bitch for an hour and a half, right? And just talk, just vent. And then you can, the next meeting can do something else. But make it the objective, not a byproduct. Yeah. Or, yeah, like, don't let it hijack the thing. Okay. Exactly. Let's keep going. Um, so... Yeah. Another thing, this relates back to, I think, our first or second webinar is have an objective. So, um, you know, if you've been watching these, you know that concrete objectives be, are give us purpose to the meeting. They can inspire other tactics. And, um, and then the last part, Steve, maybe you could talk about this, is like ha making sure that those tactic ideas or those individual steps don't get lost. Yeah, and that's the biggest problem often, what happens between meetings, um, is we get all excited about something, and then if it doesn't get assigned to a person or a group of people, and the best is a group of people that then assigns a person in their group to follow up on it, then you show up a week later, two weeks later, and it's like starting at ground zero again. Um, and so having this idea of, okay, there's an objective for the meeting, but then at the end, you have an objective for what you need to get done before the next meeting keeps things productive, makes people feel like they're moving towards solving that objective and ultimately the general goal. Cool. Um, okay, so next, uh, this is Steve's thing from oh, yeah. Lowry Side Collective. Yeah, yeah. So this this was um, something I learned from uh, a great organizer named Alex Vitale. 
um, we had been a community organization. It was a lot of fun. We had food at meetings and so on and so forth. We did all the things you're supposed to do. And we'd been meeting for about two months. And Alex said, we got to do something. And I was like, we're not ready to do anything. He says, no, we got to do something. Because if we don't do something, we're going to be a group that talks and doesn't do something. Okay, so I said, okay, well, that sounds good. Let's come up with something to do. And so the idea was is to liberate an empty lot for a space that was going to be a park. And we were going to go in, take it over, clear up all the trash and so on and so forth in the neighborhood, and then say, basically, this is a people's park, and we're going to pressure the government to make it a real park. Now, it turns out that the ground we liberated was going to be structured to be a park anyway. Um, and so what we did is did basically a really easy win, which was we liberated a park, said we were going to make it into a public park, and lo and behold, it was a public park. Now, that might be a little bit too cynical for people, um, and I felt a little dirty about it as well, but the general principle is really important, which is you want an objective which people can accomplish, so it's a group that accomplishes things. It's like picking off the lowest hanging fruit at first, so that you, uh, what I had here in the note is like wins build momentum and morale. So the point is not necessarily the, the object, or part of the point is the objective itself, but part of the point is creating a pattern um, and, and having people feel like, wait, we are doing something. Um, another thing I had, which is, I've been to a lot of groups or meetings where the initial part of it is like, let's talk and like, let's all get on the same page and understand each other. And that that becomes one of the early objectives, even if it's kind of unspoken. And it's really hard to figure out what you have in common through talking. I, this is a, a theory I have. That yeah. what, what I've seen happen more often is people start dividing differences smaller and smaller and smaller in identifying who they are in, a, in as different from everyone else. And what's great about an easy win is that you can build relationships through the work. So you do yeah. these really quick introductions, you get people working on stuff, and in the working together, they start talking and, you know, they at least have that working relationship. So then if differences do come up, there's a working relationship that you can fall back on. Yeah. And it's really it's, helpful it, to get people working together. Yeah, because it's this concrete thing that needs to get done by the end of the day. Um, and in a way that forces people to overcome their differences. We end our workshops by brainstorming, building props, and executing an action in 24 hours. And one of the reasons we do it is because that's the moment when people actually have to work together. Literally, they have to hold something up while someone else paints it. And that sort of so just you know practical ability is kind of ideology goes to the side, differences go to the side, and it's just like, yeah, we built this together. Here it is. So this last one, we're going to blow through a little bit because we've talked about it in other webinars, but we, um, make space for people to dream. Um, the, this sounds... Oh, uh, go on. You're, you're the dream guy. <laughs> no, no. This sounds counterintuitive to what we've been talking about, structures and objectives and so on and so forth, but it actually, creating a space for dreams actually can be an objective. And we have to create structures in order to create spaces to dreams. Does that make sense, Steve? Yeah, yeah. Okay. But I think okay. that if you just have a meeting about what's practical, you won't actually achieve the, the great things that you could. That you need to like you as a as someone in a meeting with a group of people, like part of your role is inserting the the the, the utopic ideas, the wild ideas, the yeah. Like the let let's just imagine what if we could do this uh, yeah. in order to push the group further. And so we've developed structures um, in order to stimulate dreaming. Yeah, uh, and we're going to do and, that with you. And yeah. one thing I wanted to say though is some people might resist this. <laughs> yes, you'll always get someone that's like, "No, we need to be realistic. We need to be honest about what we can't do." Do you remember right. that? We have, <laughs> <laughs> we have this mythic person. Well, it's not mythic. It's actually a real person who's become a myth, with what we call the dour Swede. We were in Sweden, Gothenburg, Sweden, and we started talking about utopia, and someone literally interrupted us.
to say, I cannot do this because it's impractical, it's naive. We need to talk about what we can't do. And Steve and I were just like, what? Yeah. <laughs> um, and that person basically, you know, was resisting this idea of dreaming. Yeah. And didn't, so call it, didn't call get it as much done. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, so this is how we do it in our workshops. Um, one thing we'll do, and th this is just to give you a taste, and we wanted to get you involved in this and model some of what we're talking about. It's a little bit hard to do it in the, in the structure of a webinar, but we're going to give it a shot. So we'll put an objective on the table. And we ask people, we give them 15 minutes, and we want 10 ideas for tactics that are going to work towards that objective. Which is absurd. The idea, I mean, groups spent months coming up with one tactic for an objective. But we purposely structure it into 15 minutes because it allows you to just, OK, I've got this idea. I've got this idea. You don't argue about whether it's a good idea because you don't have bloody time to argue whether it's a good idea. It's just about getting the ideas out. You just have to and write then, them down. And then we also have another uh, trick. See? Yeah. So the seven of the ideas, the first seven, have to be impossible, meaning totally you don't have enough money, you don't have enough people, you don't have enough time to do it that way, or it's just, a lot of physics. Yeah, it's physically impossible, and. Yep. We one time forgot to say, do these impossible ones first. And we went around the room. And so we ended up doing a sort of uh, test. So half the room decided to do the possible ones first. And the other half decided to do the impossible ones. The ones that did the impossible ones ended up with way more than 10 ideas. And the ones that did the possible ones first had trouble coming up with three. So the impossible ideas are designed to get the uh, get some ideas out on the table and get the juices flowing. And what happens often is that people will say an impossible one, and then someone else in the group like, "That's not impossible. We could do that." And like, "Oh, okay, we'll put that in the possible list." Yeah. And that happens over and over again. Yeah. So we're going to do this with you, and we're going to put this objective out on the table here. Uh, and this is one that. I like because it's kind of, it's not very sexy. Yeah, <laughs> um, we like boring stuff. Yeah, it's about Russian interference in the US election. Apologies to non-US folks, but hopefully you can join us. Um, so the objective is to have Congress authorize a special independent commission to investigate Russian interference in the election. Now, the main levers of power for this are Senators Lin uh, Lindsey Graham and John McCain. They're the ones that would that, are, that have promised that they're going to follow an investigation wherever it goes. Um, they've said they were going to do this. And then uh, in North Carolina, Senator Burr's Intelligence Committee can also do this. There's also Republican senators that have expressed some interest and might be able to be swayed. And then there's every person, everyone's like individual representatives that we can put pressure on to do this investigation. So... The question then is, if this is the objective, we need tactics to move towards this. And what we want you to do now is start to think of impossible tactics. Right. And this is super important, OK? Don't be practical. Be absolutely absurd. Um, and while you're doing that, we'll tell a story. So about... yeah, just write them into the chat, and then we'll talk about them in a sec. Um, so we were once in uh, South Texas. And we were working on um, a, a really boring campaign. Um, it was about taxes. Equitable, equitable funding and taxes in the Texas state budget. And the Texas state budget, as you might well imagine, is skewed towards the rich um, and against the poor. Furthermore, we learned from working with our Texas uh, comrades is that the the Texas legislature is entirely Republican, or the Republicans control the Texas legislature, and they're all born-again Christians, um, or at least pretend to be born-again Christians. Um, so in the name of God and Jesus, they create budgets which skew towards the rich. Um, and so one of the things we were trying to figure out was how to build popular pressure um, against these politicians, and how to just put the issue of what is a just budget on the table. And um, we gave them that sort of objective and said, okay, go out and do things. Come up with ideas. 
And after about five or ten minutes, uh, we kind of were walking around the tables, and one group of which these two um, elderly Latina nuns were part of that group said, we're having a real problem coming up with the absurd ideas. And we're like, oh, they could be anything, absolutely anything, right? And yeah, thank you, Steve. Thank you for the visual there. <laughs> they were a little older than that, um, but uh, than the flying, and they couldn't fly. Um, but we asked them to think about flying, that anything was possible, right? Just like the flying nun could fly. Um, and they said, anything? I said, yeah, anything. She's like, well, we're nuns. All these people uh, say that they're Christians. We're going to bring back Jesus. And he's going to actually school all these politicians about what a real Christian budget would look like, right? We're like, all right, that's great. And after that, they came up with other things, aliens and invasions. And, and you know, we've gone around the world and people come up with all these wacky things. Anytime you're in Africa, it's always going to be ancestors come up from the grave, okay? In the United States, for whatever reason, there's always alien abductions. Um, and so it's kind of this sort of a local version of uh, absurdity, but just let your mind run wild. All right, so put any ideas out there, wildest tactics possible for this very sober objective of pressuring these senators in the Senate subcommittee. And we've got some coming in. Um, so here's some answers. Actually, I'm going to turn the screen off. We'll, we'll be bigger. Um, so Amanda says, or no, I'm going to do Todd's real quick. Airdrop borscht into Congress members' yards. <laughs> so it can be like a, all right, so here, that's, that's, um, that's Todd's idea. Now, there's a lot of reasons that that's impossible. <laughs> you know, like, they're probably guarded finding the Congress members' actual homes. I, I suppose we could do that. But now, how do we make that real, right? Well, first of all, let's kind of pull it about symbolically, because what's great about the borscht, right, is it's, it's absurd, right? But it immediately references Russia, right? And it's this sort of funny reference to Russia, which is so much more sort of creative and sophisticated than just, you know, dropping in puppets of Putin, you know, which would also be cool too, right? <laughs> but we've seen that. And so I love the idea of borscht. So but we probably can't airdrop in borscht, can we? Well, I think we probably could. Well, we'll probably get shot down. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we could do it with a drone. Yeah, we could do it with a drone. Like drone deliveries. Or, or how about... Maybe, maybe not even a drone, but how about just door-to-door -door delivery? Yeah, Todd is even saying serve borscht in front of their houses and offices. <laughs> yes, exactly. Or, you know, during lunchtime, have, you know, the lunch order show up. Of course, they didn't order it, but it's borscht. Yeah, right? yeah it's, and, and then you have a gift card that's like, yeah. right? Um, exactly. Okay. Now, so, that, now that Russia has uh, thoroughly taken over, um, we'd like to introduce you to some of our specialties. <laughs> And I just want to point out, this is this is like a weird idea, but like this is how this is how you come up with things, right? It's like yeah. Steve and I right now through this conversation and just talking it through are like figuring out some tactics that might actually work and be effective. Um, let's do it with another one. I got Michael. It says town hall that targets Burr that is composed of Russian people who bring up all the positive aspects of Russian involvement in our elections. <laughs> Okay, so first, Michael, this is great, but this is not impossible, right? Like we right, exactly. <laughs> we can totally do it. We have to and, we have to figure out where Burr is, what where yeah. he is, right? And then we'd have to get the costumes. I yeah. guess there's some cost involved, but maybe there's a way that we could But probably not. I mean, it's sort of like there's you know, you just get the Cossack hats and you speak in a thick Russian accent. I mean it's probably minimal cost. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then they, they would say and then they would say like why they why it was so great. And they, they could um hold up signs that say, you know, yeah. like Russia's not so bad. Right. Um and we I mean we have activist and artist friends in Russia. I'm sure they could help out with this too. Can I just point out what I just said was really dumb. <laughs> okay, <laughs> like, but this is the point. Right. But that that's what you gotta do, right? Like Yeah, you gotta make that's space. That's not a good idea. Right, for silly ideas. Yeah. Because out of silly ideas come good ideas. Like, I'm never insulted when I say something and people are like, ugh. 
as long as it leads towards something else down the thing. But you need a space where people don't feel like they have to be smart. Yeah. Where they don't feel like they have to be clever. And you've got to structure that space into the meetings. And this is why alcohol does help sometimes, honestly. Um, but uh, it's not necessity. You can create spaces whereby that are like free um, and free from censure, free from judgment, and build that in. So I want to run have through. To be silly. I want to run through some of these other ideas because now yeah. there's a ton of. One. So Gonzalo says a reality or a game show with intelligence committee versus the White House. <laughs> yeah, it's not impossible. We could do this. Yeah. No, uh, you can, you know, again, one of the ways to always think about this is like, okay, we can't do it for real, but we can do a performance for a couple of hours in a very, you know, uh, 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 a very public place. That could be one of the town halls. It's like um, a quiz show. And I wonder, too, if the town halls have, you could have an opening act for the town hall outside. A tug of war. A tug of war. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, like the town hall, people are going to come in and they're going to wait for the for the guy to yeah. show up. So you can just sort of take over in the beginning and have this quiz show with everyone in the audience. Um, okay, so. What I love about the, the quiz show, the absurdity of it is the Secret Service people are not gonna know how to react because it doesn't look like a protest. It actually looks like you may be part of the advance team, which is warming up the audience. So uh, Michael says, send Russian thank you packages of vodka and uh, vodka nips to elected officials. That'd be really inexpensive, too. You just get the little tiny one, the airplane bottle. Yeah, exactly. And also it, it works in with the sort of, if you want to think about tactics building on one another to kind of create a general overall feel, look and feel. We got the borscht. We got the vodka. <laughs> All right. So here's a weird one. Lessa, this is good. Congratulations, because this is impossible. Use a time machine. To redo the last election. Okay. Yeah. It yeah. sounds impossible. <laughs> but we have a friend in San Francisco who is currently doing a live, a real time um, live performance of herself as the first female president of the United States of America. Oh, yeah. And she, yeah, and she has people writing policy for her. And it's literally like we got a time machine, we went back, and it doesn't get the Russian angle. So it's not a good idea, right? But she's figured out how to stop time or to redo time. Margaret. Yeah, I'm sorry. There's so many good things here um, that I'm scanning through. All right. So, well, one thing I was thinking is you could um, show up, like that could be part of the Russian people at the town hall is like, they're building a time machine to go back and change all the elections. <laughs> uh, all right. So anyway, again, you just have to say these ideas out loud. All right. So um, so this That's is the one I really like here. Casey, um, I don't know how to print. Matryoshka, the, the little nesting dolls of all of yeah. Trump's cabinet members with a message at the center and a scroll that demands action. And then you just send that to the senators. Brilliant. That and that's not, that is not impossible. No. Um, I mean, okay, <laughs> Leslie, this is offer a million dollar reward to any Russian that will submit a YouTube video that admits that they interfered in the election. <laughs> and I think just announcing that, that you're doing yeah. that, like you don't even have to get the video back, you know? Um, yeah. Oh my God. Todd, town hall actions sound like a Russian tea party. Bring some of ours. Yes. Nice. <laughs> okay, so we should wrap up. But what I want to point out is in the last five or ten minutes, just because we said, all right, think of impossible ideas, there, a bunch of ideas came out that actually worked. And if we were to talk to, through in a group, those can be the beginning of some really practical things that are going to be much more than let's call the senator. Right. Which we should call the senator. That's important. But um, to, to add the creative element, you need this this structure of the impossible ideas. Right. Call them in a thick Russian accent. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I just want to put this out there, Steve, you can <coughs> censor me if you think so. But I think we should do these. Uh, yeah. And. Why not? Um, uh how we do that is tricky, but some well, of you have maybe, good ideas. Yeah. And let's figure out a way to make those happen. 
Yeah, let's do it. Okay. And we've got your numbers. <laughs> yeah. We have ways to access So you. how about this? If anybody who submitted one of these ideas, if you want to actually develop that into a project, um, Rebecca, mysterious Rebecca, could you post a link for them to submit that project that we could work on together? And then we'll pull together a little meeting. Or if you want to work on one of these, um, get in touch and we'll, and, and we'll start. We'll see what we can do. Yeah. Okay. So let's wrap this thing up ceremonially. Ta-da! Um, okay, so we got the none. All right. Um, wh- while we wrap up, if you have any questions, we will hit those before we finish, but start typing those in. Um, just wanted to say again that the video that Steve and Pat made last week is archived online, and you can check it out. It was a good one. Uh, we've got two new webinars coming up, right, Steve? Yeah, so Rebecca will post the link to that. Uh, And the next one is on the whole idea of whether art and artistic activism should be about revealing reality as it is or imagining new realities. Um, That's called Recalibrate Reality. The next one after that is we have a guest who is coming to us from Hollywood, a successful screenwriter. Um, And he's going to, we're going to interview him about if Trump is really running an entertainment show rather than a presidency, how do we defeat him in the world of entertainment? What makes a show a hit? What makes it a bomb? And how can we get the Trump show to jump the shark? And then learn from South Africa, Steve. So we have done a lot of work in South Africa. And South Africa has a president named Jacob Zuma that Trevor Noah has compared to uh, Trump. Um, And I would say there are many aspects to what's happening in South Africa where they're just ahead of us uh, by several years. And we can learn a lot of how they've dealt with their president. Um, And so we're going to bring on some of our friends from South Africa who are very skilled organizers to talk about um, specific case studies from South Africa and what we can learn. Um, So those are the three coming up. And you can register um, in the links in the chat. uh, Rebecca, using, using my account as me, has posted those links. So you can go and register for those now. Those will be over the next few Fridays. Um, The next thing, while your questions are coming in, um, keep these free. You can donate uh, to us. It's tax deductible. One of the ways we like to think about it is if we were met you and we uh, had this conversation and you found it helpful, would you buy the coffee? Um, Then donate the amount that you would have spent on coffee. If you would have bought us lunch, then donate it on lunch, if you would have uh, taken us out for a fine meal in a, in a limo ride, we would. <laughs> and um, what else? Uh, it's getting a little dangerous at this point. Nothing and then if you were to for the working take class. us home with you and make us your concubine. <laughs> nothing is too good for the working class. <laughs> That's right. So, okay. So anyway, donate that amount. Um, so Lassa asks, what if your board or leader is not open to creativity? How do you open their minds to it? Ah, oh, that is a great, great question. Um, one of the things that's important to express to a board is how really sort of non-creative organizations like um, Fortune 500 companies and so on and so forth think about creativity and use creativity. And that out of these sort of creative brainstorming, even the most seemingly boring organizations have figured out how to integrate it into becoming better organizations. So instead of coming at it from the art angle, I think, come at it from the sober sort of business angle. Um, But there's probably some better ideas out there. Steve, do you have some? Um, Well, I'm reminded of the story that you tell about how you get ahead at Sara Lee. And one of the ways that you get promoted at the Sara Lee like baking company is uh, you have to give three examples of ideas that you had that didn't work. Yeah, creative ideas that didn't work. And so Uh, this is sort of business as usual, ironically, in the non-creative corporate sector. Um, But still, we haven't quite answered the question. I think the best way always is to just say, hey, give me an hour. Let me run this exercise, which is to come up with 10 ideas, seven which are impossible. And then afterwards, we can talk about whether it's useful or not. Um, because when people go through that experience, 
there is an aha moment of one, this is fun, this is enjoyable, but two, out of these absurd ideas come really good ideas that can actually be implemented. Another way that I talk about it, uh, or that we talk about it really in the workshops is um, about calculated risk or gambling or investing, right? So if you're a good investor, you have a lot of safe bets and then you have some more risky bets that could pay off in, in much better than your safe bets. And that what you're not saying to abandon the safe stuff, but to how much to give a little bit more to that risky part of your portfolio in the hopes that it pays off bigger. Mm -hmm. um, and I would argue that that it, it, it does. So we're, we're coming close to the end of time. That was a great question. Um, oh, Leslie suggests just hijack the meeting with your board. <laughs> there you go. Um, another Good. thing is an idea. that we do some consulting with organizations or groups like this to help out, um, you know, just quick phone calls to help out. So if that, if you, if you're, if you're hearing what we're saying and you're like, that won't work for me, um, get in touch and we can try to help out. So um, let's close up. Oh, I, I did want to mention I'm going to be at the Strand on Thursday. I uh, contributed to this book, The Artist is Cultural Producer. So if you're in New York City, I will be there. The book is uh, and, online, or you'll be able to buy it soon. It launches soon. And just so people know, it's on 13th Street and Broadway. Yeah. If, you, if you're in New York, you know where The Strand is, right? Um, so there's a link in the chat about that. Um, the, this is the book, so you know what it looks like. I just wrote one chapter, but it's it, it's it's pretty. I think it's good. Um, it's looking I, very. It's it looks very arty, Steve. It is. It's very arty. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so we're gonna end on time. And uh, just wanted to say thanks for giving us your time, and thanks for showing up. And uh, hope to see you in the weeks to come. They're gonna be good. They're going to be good. And uh, trying to think of some celebratory fanfare. Oh, oh I could have, I, I was messing around <laughs> with the music before. I could have played. Damn. Okay. ACDC. Okay. Yeah. Well, on that note, Steve's going to disappear off to the back. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> See you all next week.